Good evening, First Baptist family. It is time to get started. For those of you that may be new to us either in person or online, it is Sunday night during a global pandemic, uh, which I have subtitled on Sunday night, the Sunday night all-you-can-eat Bible buffet. Uh, it is just an all-you-can-eat Bible study. And tonight, we find ourselves in the book of Proverbs. Now, specifically, uh, we're going to be in a very large section chapters 5 through 9 of the book of Proverbs, actually primarily chapters 5, 6, and 7. We'll go a little bit into chapter 9. We studied chapter 8 extensively this morning. But for those of you who may be new to us or with us, allow me to kind of explain the rationale here. About two years ago, we began a Bible reading plan uh, where we're reading through typically one, maybe two chapters a day for a very important purpose, not to check off a box and say, oh, I read the Bible through cover to cover, but to allow it to soak into our lives. And uh, one of the things that I've heard several people say that I think is an incredible compliment. They said, you know, I catch myself reading the same chapter four or five times a day. Which means over a three-year period, you may actually read the Bible five or six times uh, rather than one time. But that's really the purpose. Uh, rather than just reading through and going on to the next day. Because many Bible reading plans, and by the way, you do know any Bible reading plan is a good reading plan, right? Any of them are. But sometimes there is so much material uh, to take in that you don't spend time kind of letting it soak in. And so that's kind of the reason, the purpose. We find ourselves in this season in the book of Proverbs. Now, the book of Proverbs is a wonderful Bible reading plan book of the Bible. It has 31 chapters. And one of the things that I've tried to practice through the years, I wish I could say I do it every single day, is whatever the day of the calendar of the month is, I read that proverb of the day. And so today is the ninth of the month. And so we would read the ninth proverb in addition to whatever else uh, that we may be reading alongside of. But that's kind of a neat thing. But when you do the book of Proverbs, we can divide it into two sections. The first 10 chapters are very narrative. Uh, they're thematic. You can kind of follow along. By the time you hit chapter 11, um, it is very much these colloquialisms, these proverbs, that the subject matters do not necessarily flow and equate to each other. And I think this is important to note. Because the Lord whom inspired scripture utilized an instrument, an individual by the name of Solomon. Solomon, as we discussed this morning, is known as the wisest of souls in the history of the world. In 1 Kings chapter 3, the Lord comes to him and says, okay, Solomon, you can have anything you want. What do you want? He says, give unto me wisdom. And one of the things that you'll discover in Solomon's life as you begin to look at his life, almost kind of a biographical sketch, is that he started off pretty strong, but he waned in the end. He allowed the influences of the world, the idols of the false gods to come into his life, many of them through right relationships that we will discuss tonight from Proverbs. And so as the Lord gave him this information, he gave him the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon to give unto us. These first sections are very narrative. You can kind of follow along. By the time you get to chapter 11, you'll be dealing with subject matter A, then you'll go to B, then to C, back to A, then to D and to E. And at times, I'm going to go ahead and confess... Uh, it can get uh, a little confusing because you don't know what subject matter you're dealing with. That's why the Bible says to study the Word of God so that we might rightly divide it. If it were easy, everybody would do it. And so therefore, it requires us to study. But in this first section, a little more narrative, so to speak. Now tonight, I have a title that hopefully you will find humorous, but it's actually very serious. The issue of tonight is how to avoid my office. How to avoid ever coming to see me. Now, I want you to hear me very clearly. I would love to see you on any occasion for any purpose. But rarely, if ever, does anybody, quote, make an appointment to come in to see me and just sit down and say, Jeff, I want you to know life is great. It couldn't be better. We're on cloud nine. Family's great. Finances are great. We don't have a problem in the world. Just wanted to let you know. Bye. That is rarely what happens in my life. In fact, uh, one of the statements that I say oftentimes is that when somebody's life is falling apart, I'm either the first or the last person they call. And I'm rarely the first. In other words, typically people have exhausted every resource that they have. They have exhausted all the means of influence, wisdom, whatever it may be. And this is just how humanity responds. I've tried everything I know. I might as well give God a shot. And when people come into my presence and they're dealing with the struggles of life, the difficulties 
uh, of life. You know, just yesterday, I was talking to one of my sons because he knew the title for tonight. And obviously, I would never give specific details to anyone, much less him, regarding the conversations. In fact, I tell people when they come into my office that I have magic walls. That nothing said within these walls will ever come out of these walls. They're just magical. So you can feel safe with the information that you share. So I would never express any details or anything. That being said, it was interesting. He said, Dad, he said, when people come to see you, do you ever talk much? And I said, no, son. Because most of the time, I just listen. As they pour their life out, as they, they share their story, typically one of the first questions I will ask somebody is, all right, why are we here today? And sometimes the tears start before the words even come out. It's oftentimes not something that started the day or two before. Usually it's been around for years or sometimes even decades. They're at the end of their proverbial rope. And so that being said, we're going to deal with two of the most frequent subject matters tonight that find themselves into my office. Now, the other thing I want to share with you is this. It is my hope and desire that in a moment when we walk out of here, or those of you online turn off, it is my hope that you can leave and say, I don't struggle with that. This isn't an issue with me. I got this. That's what I hope. But I do know this, that you may be right with God on these issues, but you may have family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, people of influence that are truly struggling. And so as we deal with these issues tonight, it's going to be real easy to turn off and go, I don't struggle with that one. It's going to be real easy to say, not an issue with me. But I'm here to testify to you that the overwhelming majority of people who come into my office with a life that is being unraveled, a family that is being unraveled, when you break it down, the two issues we're going to deal with tonight are the primary issues that are at the cause and the root of all the mess in their life. And so maybe tonight, maybe tonight is not about you. Maybe tonight is about somebody you love. Maybe tonight is about somebody you live next door to. Maybe tonight is somebody you work with. Maybe tonight is somebody uh, who is yet to be a part of your family but will become a part of your family in, in near days. Maybe tonight it's about God equipping you to minister to people whose lives are falling apart. Now, don't get me wrong. Feel free when people begin to unload and say, hey, just call Jeff. He'd love to hear you. No, uh, that's fine. But at the same time, if they've knocked on your door, if they've called your phone, Hopefully the book of Proverbs tonight will give you uh, the tools necessary or the information that hopefully you can relay into their lives. When we enter Proverbs chapter 5, for the next three chapters primarily, there are two subject matters that are dealt with. The Bible is very open, very transparent, and shall I say very clear about these subject matters. The two issues that I have titled tonight to be uh, as, quote, professional as possible, are intimate issues and monetary issues. The two things that people's lives unravel at, as far as a, as a core issue the most are the issues of their personal intimate life, and I think we all understand what I'm referring to there, and their finances. Those are the two issues. And so tonight, what I simply want to do through these chapters is just kind of walk through. This is a sketch. This is an overview of how does it start? What are the consequences that nobody ever intended to occur? What are the warning signs that we should pay attention to? And oftentimes, what are the end results if not addressed properly? Now, I will say that we are going to spend the majority of the time probably on the first issue because you're going to discover that the first issue oftentimes leads to the second one. So, that being said, let's begin with the issue of intimacy, the issue of one's private life, one's personal life, families, relationships that come apart at the seams because somebody is with somebody they had no business being with doing things they had no business doing. Let me say it a little more clearly. I've made this statement before, even on a Sunday morning, and it is absolutely true. 95% of the problems that I hear in people's lives would never occur if people would just keep their pants zipped. And I do not apologize for saying it that way. It is absolutely true. If people could get a handle on their personal, intimate, quote, issues and how they respond to God in light thereof, 
most overwhelmingly, at least the ones that come to my life, most of the issues would not even be present. You know, people say, well, we're having trust issues. We're having communication issues. Well, what have we broken trust on? You can fill in the blank. What are we not communicating about? You can fill in the blank. So, that being said, in chapter 5, how does it all start? How do those intimate issues, how do they begin in a home? How do they begin in a marriage? How do they begin in a family? I want to begin in verse 1. It says, My son, attend unto my wisdom, bow thine ear to my understanding, that you may regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. Her mouth is smoother than oil. Her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou cannot know them. Hear me now, therefore, O children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and some not the house or the door of her house. Mm. How does it start? When the family is unraveled, when it is fractured, when trust has been broken, when a strain has implemented itself how does it start notice it says here the lips of a strange woman you know more often than not when there has been a violation of this issue in one's home marriage relationship and the family and such typically started casually there was never the intention for the end result i've said this before it's about another subject matter I've never had anybody who came into me and said, I just woke up one day and said, I want to be a full-fledged drunk. That's all I desire to be. How did it start? It started with being in a social setting, a little bit of peer pressure maybe, and it always starts with one here and one there. And next thing you know, it is a snowball effect. Most of the trust issues, most of the intimacy issues that happen within a home that tear up a home typically start with what we might call a casual relationship, a friendship, so to speak. And let me speak in contemporary terms, social media. One of the unfortunate beauties of social media is that you can connect with people you have no business connecting with by the click of a button. You don't have to travel thousands of miles. You have no idea how many people have come in my office, tears in their eyes, broken hearted because their spouse is now entertaining a relationship other than theirs. And when I ask, how did it happen? More often than not, there is the mention of some type of social media or casual relationship that initiated it all. It talks about the lips of this strange, of this, uh, strange woman. They dropped this communication it always starts with the talking. It always starts with the communication. Notice what it says in verse 8. Remove yourself far from her. Don't even go to the door of her house. You know, just to be blunt with you, my wife is here in the room. I don't text women that are not her. I just don't. I think it's just a little too intimate, if that makes sense. Oftentimes, if there's a... A female that I need to communicate with, she is on the text thread. And it's kind of a group thing here because I, I want everything to be transparent and open. And guess what? She does the exact same thing. You do know that the majority of our ministers on staff are male, correct? And sometimes she has to communicate with them. Think, and she always comes to me and says, by the way, I'm going to text so-and-so about whatever it may be. Just want you to know. Completely open, transparent. Nobody's hurt. Nobody's upset. The problem is when that happens behind the scenes in quote-unquote secret, secret remove yourself now the unintended consequences i've learned that when the relationship goes sideways because of said manner nobody ever intended it to crash and burn nobody set out and said i hope this destroys my family i hope this ruins my relationship with my kids i hope nobody ever says that go over to chapter six for just a moment i want you to notice what it says here uh, beginning in verse 16 Chapter 6, verse 16, it talks about what I like call the unintended consequences. It says, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are a, a, an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, the hands that shed innocent blood, 
A heart that devises wicked imagination, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that soweth discord among his brethren. Let me just start with those for just a moment. The shedding of innocent blood. I know that time tonight will not allow for all the stories that I have been privileged to walk through and to assist, but let me go back to my pre-pastor days. I'll keep it brief tonight, but I'll never forget the day that I walked into my apartment as a sophomore in college. I'd been busy. I'd gone to class. I'd gone to practice. And I walked in, and I did what I normally do, walked the path I normally do, and I had to do a double take because I was blessed to have a roommate who had more financial wherewithal than I did. And I know this was years ago, but we had a pretty good-sized television in our apartment. And I noticed that it was gone. It was missing. I thought we had been robbed. I started looking at other things, and I'll cut the story short. I found out a couple hours later when he and his girlfriend came back that they had pawned the TV to pay for a procedure to end a pregnancy. You know, when they started dating, I promise you it was never on their mind, I hope we end somebody's life because of this. I hope we shed innocent blood because of this. That's never the intention, is it not? It's an unintended consequence that innocent blood is often shed. And I do know, and, and here's where I'm going to get to meddling, so just put up with me. I do know that there are medical reasons out there, but can we all just understand that the majority of shed blood of an innocent child in the womb is because of convenience and because we're in a position now we didn't want to be in and we want out of it now. The shedding of innocent blood. How about verse 18? A heart that devise wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to running to mischief. You know, I'm going to use a phrase that became popular in the 60s. We called it the, quote, sexual revolution. Let's do anything we can that we know we're not supposed to do. And let's do it loud and let's do it proud. Did they not? If, if you want a grand display of that, just watch any of the footage from what we know as Woodstock. It was on perfect display for everybody. And it began to establish, unfortunately, a, a pattern in our culture that is well received. Their feet ran to mischief. I don't think that casual conversations, I don't think friendships as a sidebar, I don't think anybody says, you know, I, I really hope an innocent life is lost because of this. I really hope that those I love run to mischief and purposefully try to do that which will tear our family apart. That's never the intended consequence. It's the unintended consequence. As you move on, go down into verse 25. It says, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes be not burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Think about that for just a moment. There's three other unintended consequences there. Nobody entertains a, quote, friendship with someone they shouldn't have business having a friendship with and says, you know, it is my goal here to go bankrupt. It is my goal to lose all my financial wherewithal. And last time I checked, because I deal with people all the time, when marriages and families break up, it is expensive for everybody involved. It's expensive financially. It's expensive emotionally. We could get all that. But a piece of bread. I've known individuals throughout the years who were financially secure. And because the other party decided they wanted to go to other playgrounds, it caused them financial duress. The parties who decided to go, quote, on the other side of the fence, experienced them as well. Verse 28, can one go upon the hot coals and his feet not be burned? You know, one of these days, I'm going to write a book called If My Walls Could Talk. I'm going to be long retired when I write it. I'm going to change all the names. I'm going to change all the locations. Don't panic. It, you're not going to be able to figure out you, okay? You might be surprised 
how many people have discovered their spouse was cheating on them because they went for a wellness check and had an STD? Mm -hmm. You can't walk on hot coals and not get burned. Nobody ever intended to get one themselves, much less to pass it on to their spouse. Notice what it says in verse 29, he that goes in his neighbor's wife, whoever touched her shall not be innocent. It goes on later to talk about being hunted by the other man. No one ever enters a relationship desiring to be despised, desiring to be hunted, desiring to be broke, desiring to shed innocent blood. These are all unintentional consequences. But unfortunately, they are the reality when we decide to do it different than God's plan. When we step out of his provision, when we step out of his safeguarding. You know, so many times when we look at the famous Ten Commandments and other places in the Bible where it says, thou shalt not. We think that God is depriving us when really he's protecting us. Okay, so there's not a a brief momentary sense of satisfaction, but there's also not a lifetime of pain, agony, misery, regret. He's really protecting us. So what are the warning signs? How do we know that we might be headed in the wrong direction? Now this is for those of you not only who may be unfortunately walking the wrong way, but maybe you have people in your life. Maybe you have children, grandchildren, neighbors, coworkers that you just know it's not headed the right direction. How do you know that it's not headed the right direction? Go into chapter 7 of Proverbs. And by the way, chapter 7 is the chapter that all young men should read on a very regular basis, at least once a month on the 7th of the month. It gives in graphic detail what happens when we decide to step outside of God's provision. It talks about the experience of that woman whose lips were so enticing. You get into verse 9. It says, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and the dark night, behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and with the subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without. Now in the street she lieth waited every corner. So she caught him. She kissed him. And with impudent face said, Unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face. And I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. For the goodman of the home is gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him. He will come at home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield, and with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Now let me give you some stumbling blocks here, some warning signs. Notice in verse 9, it happens in the dark of the night. My wife and I have lost count how many times we've told our boys Most things that you should not be involved with happen late at night. Rarely, if ever, does the temptation to or the opportunity to be involved in what we're talking about happen in broad noon, in broad daylight. In the dark of the night. In the secret places, at the secret times, hidden agendas disguised social media accounts, hidden numbers, whatever it may be, in the darkness of the night. Verse 10, her attire. When there are people who adorn themselves for the sheer purpose of showing all that they can show, what do we see? We see the Proverbs 7 woman. The purpose is not for, quote, true love. The purpose is for what we've just read. Notice in verse 11, she's loud and she is stubborn. In other words, and by the way, don't make this necessarily gender specific here. But you've got a person who's always boisterous, always loud, always controlling the situation, always dictating the agenda. It's their way or the highway. It's always what they so desire. And it happens usually at times that are not open to the rest of the world. Notice what it says in verse 12 lieth in wait. Those relationships always seem to compromise at the least opportune of times. 
People will be asked, make a decision. Do as described in Proverbs 7 or go to your kid's ball game. Which one do you want to do? In other words, they lie in wait. They get them to render that decision of following the flesh versus being as they should. Verse 13, she catches him and kisses him. A forward, overt individual. In other words, pushes the limits. I'm going to go ahead and say this, and I know what I'm about to say makes me absolutely, completely archaic and old-fashioned, and I just don't care. It blows my mind today. And by the way, I've got teenagers in the home. And I don't have girls, and so those of you who are raising girls, please do not throw the arrows at me. I'm just telling you, I am blown away at the forwardness of young ladies today. We have so neutralized the gender that courtship isn't present anymore. When you hear stories, and by the way, this isn't our family stories, when you hear stories of people that a young man just trying to do what he's supposed to do in life, and there's a young lady, scantily clothed, texting hundreds of times a day, trying to talk him out of going to ball practice so he can spend a little time with her. I think we've seen how that story ends a whole lot of times, do we not? Notice what it says in verse 19, the goodman is not at home. Oftentimes they want to meet up, they want to do, when those who should be present observing and watching are not present to observe or watch. It's in secret, it is hidden. Notice the fair speech, the flattering of lips. There's warning signs everywhere. The problem is, and I'm going to go ahead and use this illustration because it's very relevant to society, but also those of us who live in this part of the country. During deer season, you do know that the buck, the male deer, typically does, has a better chance of dying by way of truck than bullet, right? You know why? It's called the rut. Y'all know what the rut is? That's mating season. Where the deer is so focused on the girl, they will stand in the middle of the highway and get hit by a truck. Because they're so focused on what they're at. Y'all can laugh all you want, but it's real. You've got individuals who won't show up for work, won't do what they're supposed to do. They won't go to their kid's ball game. Because some woman with flattering lips has talked them into doing something. By the way, you know it goes the other way, too. And so those are just kind of the, the warning signs we see. So what's the end result? How does this all play out? Let's pick it back up in verse 23. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O you children, attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her past, for she has cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Verse 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. By the way, I made the comment earlier, and we say it again. This goes for both sides of the gender equation. There are many a men who have drug women to the chambers of hell. There are many women who have drug men to the chambers of hell. But the strategies don't change. How many young men have talked a young lady to lying to her parents and going somewhere they shouldn't go after hours and sneaking out of the house? Fits in line right here with Proverbs chapter 7, does it not? The end never ends up the way they desired. I think it's interesting, her house is the way to hell. I've heard this statement more times than I care to hear. I've heard people make this statement regarding their marriage, their homes, children, whatever it may be. They say, Pastor, forgive me for saying it, but our life is just hell right now. It's pretty biblical, isn't it? Because that's the end result. And when we make a decision to not do it God's way, when we make a decision to follow the lust of the flesh, when we decide that that which is, quote, on the proverbial other side of the fence is greener than what we currently possess, we discover that really the grass is brown, burned up, and miserable. And that's exactly what occurs can a man take fire in his bosom and not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals and not be burned? 
See, the root problem is somebody, and it can be a man or a woman, saying, I got this. It's not that big a deal. It'll never go the wrong way. It's fine. What happens? They get burnt. Now, that is one of the major reasons that people are in my office. Sometimes it's their family member. Sometimes it's their spouse. Sometimes it's a loved one. Sometimes it's a dear friend. And I desire to, I hope tonight that this, I hope none of you are going, have you been reading my text messages? I hope none of you are saying, have you been listening to my phone calls? But here's what I do hope. I don't want anybody to ever walk down the path we just read. But if you know somebody or you have someone in your life who you see walking down that path, hopefully the Lord will bring you to Proverbs and you can have an intervention in their life and let them know this is not going to work out the way you think it is because more often than not it works out the way of Proverbs 5-7. through Now, there's another issue that brings people into my office a whole lot. It's the issue of money. Now, they don't ever come in and say, Pastor, I want you to know I got so much money, I don't know what to do with it, where can I give it? That's not what I'm talking about. It's much the opposite. You know, there's an old statement that sin will take you further than you ever plan to go. It will keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. And that's not just a colloquialism, that's that's the truth. You know that sin is expensive, right? We have billboards today that actually give you the amount of money it will cost you to either A, sever your family relationship, or B, get out of jail because of some ill decision that you've made. And it's never cheap. It's always very, very expensive. When you get into chapter 6 of the book of Proverbs, it deals with a subject matter that is used in over 2,500 verses in the Bible. Now, when you get to the second half of the book of Proverbs, chapter 11 on, It is an overwhelming amount of dealing with finances and money. Here in this narrative section, not nearly as intense, but trust me, it's very vivid here in just a moment. 2,500 verses in the Bible in regards to how we handle money. And did you know that Jesus Christ talked more about money than he did personal salvation? You say, why is that? Because a lot of times it's the desire for money that keeps people from being saved. It is the desire to have more, to quote, remember the parable of the guy who wanted to build bigger barns? He said, what I have is not enough, I want a little bit more. He says, do you not know that tonight your soul is required of thee? And so sometimes it is the chasing after the intimate issues of life. And sometimes it's chasing the dollar of life that will get us in a whole, whole lot of mess. So when it comes to monetary issues... Where does it start? I want you to go back actually into chapter 5 for just a moment for the starting point. We've talked about this woman with the flattering of the lips. We've talked about the fact that her ways are movable. She's in the dark and such. Verse 9, lest thou give honor unto others and your years be as the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Now, I want you to know from the very beginning, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a Series 7 accountant, I do not have a degree in finance, but I have a couch in my office that people have spent hundreds and thousands of hours upon. And did you know what I've discovered? That monetary issues are never the initial problem. In fact, they're always the result of the other issues. In fact, the intimacy issues are, might be what we call the entry drug. You ever heard the term an entry drug? It is the thing that gets you started down the wrong path. You do know that people who have addictions to substance don't start by stealing. They start by using. And once they've used and they don't have enough resources to continue their habit, what do they do? They steal. They take more. They violate people who trust they should not violate so to utilize their habit. And so when we talk about monetary issues... When someone is having all kinds of financial strain, all kinds of issues, they're struggling when it comes to finances. Hear me clearly, the overwhelming majority of the time, there's a lot of water under that bridge, and you're just getting the top of the wave. There are other issues, there are other decisions. In fact, there was a book that was written uh, some years ago. It's an interesting read. It's entitled America by the Bootstraps. 
let me give you a little background of this book because it's, to me, anybody who deals with benevolence ministry, anybody who deals uh, with those who are in a life of poverty, it is just an, an absolute uh, read. There's a, a young lady who was in what we might call a financial situation of poverty. But she was trying to claw her way out. And in the process of trying to claw her way out, she thought that receiving more education would help. So she would go to a community college, typical, um, I guess, early 30s community college student, go for a class or two, take a semester off class or two, just never could get a hold of things, as you'll find out in just a moment. Well, in one of her classes, and if you've ever done online education, one of the things you do is you have these online dis discussion questions. Uh, the professor puts a question out, you make your commentary, and then you respond to others. And the question was in regards to poverty and those who live in perpetual poverty, this was her life. And so she just decided to pour it out. Why does she and others make the decisions that they make? It was such a good response that the professor asked her, can I publish your response? And so she met with the student. They crafted it, turned it into a journal article. And it was published by a news media that we know as the Huffington Post. Its initial publication was read by almost one million people when it was posted. Fast forward a few years, it's been turned into a book where she deals with subject matters of those who are in poverty. And it's interesting because as she talks about the subject matters, she talks about intimacy issues, she talks about addiction issues, she talks about a whole slew of issues, and here's what she says. That those issues are terribly more expensive than you could ever imagine that they are. And when you make a decision that gets you in a mess, when you make an ill choice in life, it always financially costs you more than you ever want to pay. Particularly if your current occupation pays you by the hour and you have to miss your work to go pay the bill that the decision led to. Here's the thing that I found most interesting about her, really, poverty biography. Is she said, now these are her words, not, not mine. She said that true poverty doesn't exist because of a lack of money. You do know, since what we might call the presidency of Richard Nixon, what we might call his presidency, let me say that, that the United States of America has poured over $25 trillion into trying to eradicate poverty. $25 trillion. You know we could pay off the debt with that, right? Or almost. Has it helped? Has it gotten better? You know what she says? She says the real reason that people are in perpetual poverty is not a lack of money, but a lack of real relationships. See, it's never the initial problem, right? Because trust has been broken, because a decision is made, because things have been violated, now we have a financial issue. Let me give you an illustration from her book and then utilize it in my own life. She talks about the fact of having an unreliable car, one that consistently breaks down. And in our home, they laugh, they, they call them beater cars, okay? Because it looks like somebody's just been beating on them the whole time, and they sound that way as well. She said, if you've got to get to work, and your car breaks down, and you're in perpetual poverty, you don't have any real relationships. You've strained yourself from your family. You don't have friends you can trust. You've taken and stolen from those who you should have a good relationship with. She said, the problem is then you've got to call a record service. And those record services are not cheap. And you discover that to tow your car to the shop, not including getting it fixed, will be at least a half a week's work. Money that you needed for food, money you needed for shelter, money you needed for the necessities of life is now going to a record service. It's a lack of relationships, not money. Several years ago, my oldest son and I went to Texas on a trip. I know this is going to be surprising for those of you who know me well. We went to go watch a car race. And on the way back, the transmission in my vehicle decided it didn't want to go any further. We were left stranded on the side of the road. We were about five and a half hours from, quote, home at the time. I called the service that we had that possessed uh, the ability to tow. And I discovered... That to tow my vehicle to my residence from where it was currently located was going to be $1,200. That's a lot of money. 
But I got a friend. He may be watching right now. I got a dear friend of mine that has a car hauler. His hobby is drag racing. He's a dear friend of mine. I called him up. I said, brother, I'm stuck. It's Saturday night, and I'm supposed to preach in about 10 hours. Is there any way you think you could, quote, get me home tonight? Now, you do realize that's five hours to me and five hours back. He said, I think I can do it. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll buy all your gas and all the food you want to eat plus anything else you tell me. Because whatever you tell me is going to be cheaper than $1,200. I got home that night, two tanks of gas in his truck and a good meal in our belly. Why? Because of a relationship that I possessed. See, when we start talking about the issue, see, when it says, let strangers be filled with your wealth, you do realize the issue of finances happened because the relationships had been broken. Financial strain always starts with broken relationships. You don't have people to come alongside of you to help you. So what are the unintended consequences? Go into chapter 6, verse 30. I know it's Proverbs. We're kind of skipping around just a little bit. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. The unintended consequences. If somebody steals from you, they steal money or they steal food because they literally did not have food in their house. You might have a stern conversation with them. But don't you think as a believer at the end of the day, you, you'd want to help them out? You want to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You understand that when people's children are starving, do you not understand why they might steal? I do. I, I really do. If my family had nothing to eat, and they were beginning to exhibit the signs that we see of people who, have, who are malnutritioned. I'm going to be honest with you. I love the Lord and I love Scripture, but I might be tempted to break into a house just to feed my kids. Don't we all get that? But how often is that really the case? It's rare. See, the unintended consequences is that when it comes to bad financial decisions, we actually end up hurting the people that we claim to love the most. We take advantage of, we lie, we cheat, we steal, we say we're doing it for A, we end up doing it with B. We end up claiming that I need it for this project, but we go and we waste it on an addiction or whatever it may be. Trust is broken, relationships are broken, and then when they're in a real mess, where they really do just need food on the table, there's no one to come alongside of them. See, the unintended consequences is once that ball begins to roll, the relationships get broken. So what are the warning signs? Go back up to the beginning of chapter 6 of Proverbs. Let me give you some warning signs for the financial end of this. It says, my son, if thou be surety, or basically that means a cosigner in our language, for thy friend, if thou stricken thy hand with a stranger, you are snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth, do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, as the bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. Provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? How long wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. Here are the warning signs that someone is headed the wrong direction when it comes to the financial aspects of life, which typically are the results of another deeper issue in life. First couple verses, they ask you to quote co-sign for them. That means they don't have the ability, they don't have the surety, they do not have the credit, whatever it may be. Let me give you some advice. I did not originate this myself. I learned it from a much wiser soul. If somebody who you love, somebody who you respect, somebody comes to you and they are in need of money, don't sign a loan with them. If you feel so led, just give it to them. Just give it to them without strings. Just give it. Why? Because then you won't get mad when they don't pay you back. If you give it to them, you don't expect anything in return. If you co-sign with them, the last thing you expected was your car to be repoed. See, do you see how the hurt and the division can increase? It says, do not be surety. 
if you know someone in need and you want to assist, just give it to them. It'll save a whole lot of heartache. But people are headed the wrong direction when they need you to sign for them to acquire money. That's a pretty clear warning sign, is it not? Second thing I want you to see for the sake of time, we'll keep it brief. Notice at the end of the passage we read a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. That they're not willing to labor for their food. They're not willing to extend themselves. I'm going to share a story uh, about myself and a friend of mine this evening. I, I promise I'll keep it brief. I'm one of those, you've heard me say this throughout the years. If I'm at a gas station and somebody needs assistance, they, they just I have a yes face. They're, they're going to ask me. My wife will testify. It's happened throughout my entire life. But I learned early in life from wiser people that when somebody comes and says, hey, man, I, I need $5, I need $10, I'm hungry, I always learned, okay, fine, I'll get you some food. I'm not going to give you money. What, what do you want? My children were with me. In fact, my youngest two were with me because we're on the way to a soccer tournament, the oldest one. We were in, I, I can't make this stuff up, and they'll testify. We were in the drive through line to McDonald's. I got little kids. That's what they want, right? In the drive through line, when a guy walks up looking for my financial assistance, knocks on the window, and he says, hey, he says, can I have a few dollars for lunch? I said, no, you can't have a few dollars, but take a pick on the menu, and I'll order it for you. He said, you know, true story. I'm not really feeling McDonald's. I'd like Arby's. I said, the Arby's, that's half a mile down the road. He said, yeah. I said, i tell you what. I said, if you'll meet me at the drive through at Arby's, as soon as I'm done here, I'll buy you what you want for Arby's. No more than five seconds later, it started pouring down rain. And that man walked a half a mile in the rain without an umbrella and was standing at that drive through waiting for me. Now, why did I share that story with you? That man was hungry. That man was hungry. He was willing to walk. He was willing to bear the elements. And he got a great meal. In fact, I supersized it for him. I thought he deserved it. A friend of mine who serves at another local congregation tells story after story of people coming in. I need money for this. I need money for that. He was in another state. He came up with a plan several years ago. Church had a lot of acreage behind the building. And somebody would come and say, hey, I need a few bucks for this or that. Can you help me out? He got permission to do so. And he started a ministry there where for $10 an hour, they would give you a shovel to start digging. In other words, we're going to give you a job, $10 an hour. Dig all day long. At the end of the day, we'll give you $80, whatever it was. Do you know how many people quit within an hour? It just rolled. There was one guy, though, who said, I'll dig. He dug all day. Paid him his money. Came back the next day. He said, you need me to dig? He said, no, why don't you fill in the hole that you dug? So he did. He came back the next day and the next day. And he kept coming back. A couple of weeks later, they put him on the maintenance staff at the church. Because he was so willing to work. Notice what it says. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding in. If someone is begging you for financial assistance and help and they're not willing to, quote, work, that's a warning sign that you're going to have a bigger mess on your hands down the road. If you feel led to help them, give it to them. But don't co-sign or it's going to be your car that gets repoed in the mess. So what's the end of it? What's the end? Look in verse 5. Deliver yourself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, as a bird from the hand of the fowler. You're going to end up in the same web they've weaved. Deliver me. You're going to end up in the same mess. You're going to end up running from, avoiding phone calls, creditors, whatever it may be. I think it's interesting. Deliver me as a roe from the hunter, as a bird from the hunter. If you've ever had the privilege of hunting in any capacity, as soon as that animal hears the slightest noise or sees the slightest thing, they are, they are gone. And that is the image. The picture that we have is if we do not run, we will get caught up in the same mess. Now, tonight I've shared with you two issues that find themselves frequently in my presence. Intimacy issues, monetary issues. This is a great majority of what people are struggling with. Hopefully tonight, 
It's not yours. Hopefully you can walk away going, whew, it was finally good to go to church and it wasn't about me. But I promise you know somebody who's dealing with one or more of these, do you not? And you and I have a decision. We can either be an enabler or one who intervenes. An enabler is someone who just keeps the problem going down the road. One who intervenes says, I'm here because I love you, but the madness has got to stop. You do realize the one who intervenes is rarely the receiver of accolades, correct? Why would you be so mean to me? Why would you be so harsh with me? Why would you be so this with me? I want to close tonight by quoting from Hebrews chapter 12. Whom the Lord love, he chastens. In other words, when we're headed the wrong direction and the Lord whips us and nudges us, he doesn't do it because he hates us. He does it because he loves us. And oftentimes we do and give and such thinking it's because we love them. When our true love would to see them come out of the cycle of the mess they're in. You do know that believers can get caught up in this too, right? It's not just a lost world problem. It's an everybody problem. And maybe you or somebody is caught up in a mess. It can be on another issue. But you know the warning signs are there for everything, right? If you're that person, obviously as we're walking through a COVID pandemic here, doing things a tad bit differently, you do know that we have two phone numbers that you can call 24-7. There's a phone number you can call. There's a phone number that you can text. And when you do so, there is somebody on the other end of that line. And maybe you say, you know what? I just need to talk to somebody about this. I just need to address this. Would you please do us a favor and reach out to us? I want you to know something. We want to help. We want to assist. I would not have spent tonight dealing with this if I didn't want whatever's going in your life and other people's lives to be transformed and to be addressed by the Lord. This wasn't just to pontificate. I want people to be helped. I want people on the right path. And at the end of the day, I just want people to do it God's way. Because it works out so much better. So if you know somebody or you yourself need to talk, you can do so anonymously. Remember those magic walls that I talked about? Nobody's going to know. I'll bring the Kleenex. You or they or both can cry. And we'll see how the Lord can intervene and begin to reverse the issues that have happened in their life. Before I pray, I want to make one statement. I've never seen an issue in regards to these or others that the Lord couldn't fix. Sometimes we say, I just think it's too far gone. No, it's not too far gone. It's just too bad. No, it's not too bad. The problem is we're so in it so deep is we're not willing to take the journey that the Lord wants to put us on to get out of the mess that we're in. Rarely, if ever, is the journey to freedom take a few hours or a few days. Oftentimes, it is a very extensive journey. But you can ask anyone in the scripture or anybody that you know who's seen the quote light, it is worth every, every step of the journey. So please reach out to us in any capacity. We'd love the privilege. I just want to see lives changed and transformed. And if tonight you know people that you see the warning signs, whatever it may be, pray through it, intervene, be a part of their life. Because what we read tonight is the end is not good ever when it goes left unattended. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we depart from this place, thank you for the wisdom of your word. God, thank you for a man by the name of Solomon who you used, who went wayward at times, strayed at times, fell into the trap of temptation more times than he ever should have. But God, that you redeemed his story. By warning us of the pitfalls, warning us of the ditches, warning us of the gutters in life. And God, I pray that we would not be tempted to enter in these issues or others. We would not desire, as you say so often in the book of Proverbs, the foreign waters of life. Help us, O oh God, to minister to those who we love dearly, who are hurting, who they're struggling. But God, they've got themselves in a mess. Lord, we know the conversations are hard. We know they're difficult. We know they're not fun. But God, we also know that they're biblical. So would you strengthen us with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. May our feet be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And oh God, may we be the instrument 
that you utilize to see people's lives transformed and changed. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, I'll have the Kleenex waiting. No, I'm kidding. So in all seriousness, please reach out for you or anybody else. As we are dismissed, I love hanging out with y'all. I love talking, but I've got to be in a meeting in four and a half minutes. So when I run out, I apologize in advance. God bless. See you soon. If not before, Wednesday night, 630.